Well, good afternoon to our alumni, families, and guests, and welcome to Homecoming and Family Week. My name is Lauren Griffith, and I have the pleasure of working in the Office of Engagement, supporting our graduates and families. I'll be leading you all through this conversation with our leadership from the Linda Berry Stein College of Fine Arts. I hope you all enjoyed that opening video, which was just a taste of some of the amazing content that the college is creating this semester and sharing through their YouTube channel. Just a few housekeeping items before we dive in. You may have noticed you all were muted upon arrival, but you're welcome to turn on your camera so that we can see who all is in the meeting. If you toggle between speaker view to grid view, you can view all of the speakers and guests in attendance. And please feel free to rename yourself so that we can track, keep track of who is here in the event. If you're an alum or a parent, please go ahead and add your class year or your students class year. We have several members of our team on this call, so feel free to drop in questions in the chat as well for us, and we can save those for the Q&A at the end of the event. Lastly, this session will be recorded to share out with others who cannot attend live. Now, we're thrilled to bring back the Parade of Colleges this year. Um, the Parade of Colleges is an opportunity for us to catch up with the college leadership and learn what's new in the college and with its faculty. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a Q&A at the end of the session, so please drop your questions in the chat as they come to mind, and we'll make sure that they're addressed after our conversation with the leadership from the Linda Berry Stein College of Fine Arts. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers from the college, Dean Tim Snyder and Professors Tiffany Leach and Dana Tupa. Dean Tim Snyder has been at JU for over 10 years and, a, and is a distinguished choral conductor, music educator, and researcher. Dr. Snyder was appointed as Dean to the Linda Berry Stein College of Fine Arts in 2019. Professor Dana Tupa is a visual artist and associate dean of the Linda Berry Stein College of Fine Arts. And in her role, Professor Tupa assists and supports the college faculty and staff in operations and has been instrumental in the development of the STEAM Institute for Student Design. Professor Tiffany Leach is also on the event. Uh, she's a visual artist and serves as the associate professor and chair of the visual arts department. Uh, she also serves as co-director of the MFA in visual, the visual arts program. Professor Eric DiCicco is also on the call. Professor DiCicco is a 2005 graduate and is an assistant professor of theater. And Dr. Snyder, in December of 2018, the college was the recipient of a transformational gift from alumna Linda Berry Stein. Can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that the college, that the college and its students have felt the impact of, the, of her philanthropic support? tangible benefits of this extraordinary gift are in the funding of the renovation of our facilities, specifically the on-campus Phillips Fine Arts Building, which we have begun the naming of the Stein family lobby at the front door of the college in Phillips. Last fall, we had the pleasure to dedicate that space. The future visioning and establishment of what we imagine to be an outdoor study and creative collaboration plaza adjacent to the complex bounded by Swisher Theater, Alexander Brest Dance Pavilion, and Phillips Fine Arts, the formation of the Linda Berry Stein Fine Arts Student of the Year Award. The gift richly endows our work and our mission. We're so grateful for, for that gift and um, for all of Linda's support through the years. Um, it's a really exciting time, as you mentioned, um, the college looks beautiful. Recently, it's an, it announced its division into the School of Art and Design and the School of Performing Arts. Can you all talk a little bit more about uh, that decision and kind of how it will allow for more collaborative learning experience for our students? I'll tee that one off. You know, two years ago, the faculty, board members, uh, all of our stakeholders in the college, we began to ask ourselves a question. That question was, uh, does our structure serve our needs or does our structure hold us back in certain ways? And through an 18 month process of listening, consultation, lots of conversation, a faculty task force over the summer of 2019, we arrived at a restructure that we are all very proud of. So effective July 1st, as you said, we are the Linda Berry Stein College of Fine Arts comprising the School of Performing Arts and the School of Art and Design. What this does is create, one, a stronger brand for us, a stronger definition of who we are as two communities bounded together in one college, performing artists and visual artists. In the School of Performing Arts, it strengthens the existing quality in our areas of dance, music, and music theater, and really opens the door to new curricular and formalized types of collaborations. In the School of Art and Design, 
the emerging STEAM Institute for Student Design with our new Department of Media Arts is very exciting for the future of the college. You know, here we're going to have new pathways and we're already beginning to articulate what these new pathways look like. The Faculty of Media Arts have two curriculum proposals on the table right now that will allow students in business, in communications, in English, really any major here to create a pod or a pathway to develop professional artistic credentialing in either graphic design, animation, or film. And the, the crossover between those areas uh, will we'll prepare our students to really enter the workforce with the skills that they need to be successful in new and emerging ways. So it's a very exciting time for the college and for our future. Thank you, Dean Snyder. I'll follow up with that. As a faculty under the new restructure model, um, our departments are smaller in scope, but that allows for a more intense focus within our concentrations for our students. It also opens up doors with our, having the two schools for our students to have more opportunities to continue um, to cross disciplines and double major and have two or three minors. And of course, that's um, offering a great opportunity for them as they leave JU. It really expands the breadth of what our students have as they move forward. I completely agree, guys. I mean, hey, listen, we were collaborative before the addition of the two schools. And as schools, we're each united in the goals and how each part contributes to the other. Our film students are capturing music performances and theatrical performances. Our drawing students are learning movement from dance students. Our graphic design students and media arts students are partnering with engineering students on how to pitch designs. I mean, the collaborative energy right now in the college and in both of the schools is truly beyond what I've seen in the past. The schools have independence, yet they still share this platform to partner. And it's not only within the college, it's across the colleges. I think the uh, development addition of the schools really made us bigger than we ever were. And I think uh, Dean Snyder and Tiffany hit on it. There is more stuff going on, and it seems like a division, but it is truly an addition. Eric? Yeah, I can absolutely speak to that. I, I have a personal tell, tale to share. Um, you can probably tell it looks like I haven't had a haircut since before COVID struck, and you were guessing right. Um, and that's because when it struck, the film professor reached out to me and he said, hey, I wrote a part for you in a film. And being an actor, I said, well, I don't know. I'll have to check my schedule. It's just too much. I don't know, you know. And of course, I read it, and it's brilliant. And if any of you know Alex Williman, you know how sharp and clever his mind is. And, and I can't wait for you to see this film. But I said, OK, I'll do it. And uh, I, we're talking about a 16th century French explorer here. So I've got to grow my hair out until next summer. Uh, so I just was thinking about the way Dana and Tiffany and Tim described the, the cross collaboration, and I I can't um, I can't attest to that more. And I think the restructure really gave us definition to know exactly who we are, so we know exactly what we can do, where we can go, how we can hold ourselves accountable to be more successful in the future. And so that's my um, th my 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 locks here or my personal misery of the benefits of the restructure that I get to share with everyone. Well, I, I think they look great. <laughs> um, we played a short performance at the beginning of the call, so you all had a little bit of a, a taste of what things are looking like this semester. But uh, each year, obviously, the college engages alumni, families, uh, members of the community through the Performing Arts Series. What can our patrons expect this year um, as we pivot to more of a virtual format and how, how can they attend? Thank you, Lauren. I am so pleased you selected that excerpt. Uh, you heard Dr. Shannon Lockwood, Assistant Professor of Cello and Music Theory, uh, performing on the Faculty Showcase concert. I believe it was Bach she was, she was performing. You know, it gives me cause to mention, you know, just the incredible rich legacy of music at this institution. I wonder how many of our alumni, uh, parents, and friends realize that, you know, we, we trace our our roots to the 1920s, to specifically 1923, to this institution in a grand house on Herschel Street in Riverside that at the time was called the Jacksonville College of Music. 
And it was that body of musicians training young artists in the classical model that joined uh, Jacksonville University under the vision of our founding dean, Dr. Francis Bartlett Kinney, really visionary move to create what would become the College of Fine Arts. You know, this means that our music program in the beautifully renovated Terry Concert Hall, one of the best acoustical spaces in Northeast Florida, we are credited by the National Association of Schools of Music in 1931. That's the second longest accreditation of a collegiate music program in the state of Florida. Second only to, I will say, Florida State University in Tallahassee, uh, accredited in 1930. So very proud of that, of that history. Uh, the quality of the performances that we've been delivering virtually have been outstanding. The faculty have put together a full series of performances, recitals, concerts, exhibitions in all of our spaces, Terry Concert Hall, Swisher Theater, the Alexander Brest Gallery, and in site-specific spaces. And we're delivering this work on one of two platforms, through the Stein College YouTube channel and through our college website via the Performing Arts Series link. If someone would put the, uh, this web address into the chat box, I'd sure appreciate it, www.ju.edu backslash LBS Linda Berry Stein CFA College of Fine Arts. For our friends and our alumni, this is your ticket to the body of work that we create. Through that landing page, you can access all of our product. Currently, you'll find the Master of Fine Arts in the Works virtual exhibition. You'll find the Faculty Biennial exhibition of the School of Art and Design. You will find links to events that have happened up to this point. You will uh, see a listing of our virtual events through the end of this year. And later in October, you will see a complete listing of our events through May of next year. Upcoming events that I invite you to join us include the Jacksonville University Choirs, this uh, Saturday, October 10th at 7.30 p.m., and the Senior Spotlight of the School of Art and Design, Class of 2020. Thank you so much, Dean Snyder. Yeah, that today at noon, we had a um, wonderful performance by the University Singers that we'll be sharing to um, all of our attendees from Homecoming and Family Week as well. Um, you mentioned Dr. Kinney earlier. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, a lot has taken place and changed um, inside the college. Students and faculty quickly pivoted to learning in a solely virtual environment. The college suffered the loss of its matriarch, Dr. Fran Kinney, and now you all are Kind of navigating your new normal um, of split classes and performances without audiences but the college has adapted so nicely staying really focused on your students what are you all the most proud of just looking back on on how far you've come since the beginning of all this a tremendous question thank you for the opportunity to speak to that you know dr kinney her legacy lives with us lives with us every day i'm sitting right now in her office and i'm surrounded by objects that she curated, that she found beauty and meaning, educational meaning, artistic meaning. That's inspirational, not only for me, because I have the honor to be in this space, but for our students, for whom I have the honor to introduce to Fran through these, um, these artifacts. So her legacy, in my mind above all, was embodied in her words. You know, she would say in so many different ways, but at the heart of what she was saying was, you know, what we do is not about ourselves. It's not about us. It's about others. And how inspiring, profoundly inspiring it's been to see that legacy play out in action since March. Everything we've done as an artistic community, as a university community, to prepare to return to instruction has been just that for our students and for their future and for their education. So Fran is with us. Her words are with us. You know, that's, that's what I'm most proud of. Gosh, Lauren, what a great question. I just busted out in smiles when you chose that one. It's the memories. Oh my God, the memories. You know, humanity is making history right now. We are making history through this time. And I'm proud of the teamwork, the adaptability, the collective decision-making support structures. You know, our students are right there with us, making strong memories. We've changed, but we haven't lost that ability to connect with each other. 
I'm really proud of that. We're all doing it right now in this virtual meeting. It's really cool. Oh, that's so well said. And it is such a great question. Um, as a faculty, I am most proud of the community of students and faculty that we have within our college and how the spirit of the Stein College really is about um, the ability to adapt, to succeed and persevere. And, you know, that that's really come through in this last year, that um, the way that we've been able to innovative ways to deliver our curriculum and the open lines of communication has really highlighted just what the Stein College is and the strengths that we have. Eric? Uh, yeah, I was just reflecting. Uh, I'm so fortunate to have been a student at this university and had Dr. Kenny in the audience uh, when I was on stage. And I can remember a particularly moving moment after a performance in my junior year where she just stopped me and put her hand on my shoulder as she does. Although that, that tiny little hand was like the force of a thousand ninjas stopping you. Um, and she said, well, that was just lovely. And I always carry that with me. Every rehearsal, every show, every artistic endeavor I walk into on that campus, I always work so that I can imagine uh, Fran saying, well, that was just lovely to me and how she would not accept anything less. Well said, those are beautiful memories. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find on this campus even students now who, who don't have a similar story about Fran or have heard something like that. Um, I want to make sure that we allow uh, time at the end for a question and answer. So again, if there's anything that you all want to ask, please go ahead and put that in the chat to our moderator and we will, we will get to that soon. But one last question for our speakers um, that we had prepared. Next year, your college celebrates um, its 60th anniversary. Looking back on, on kind of the history of the college, how does that make you feel and, and what do you hope the college accomplishes in its next 60 years? Sure, I'll take that, Lauren, and then I'll let my colleagues uh, chime in. You know, we've, we've educated generations of, of young artists, clearly. Their work, they are our satellites. You know, their, their, their work, their lives, their product, that's our success. That's our, that's our story. We want to take the opportunity of, this, uh, opportunity of the 60th anniversary year to reflect on that, to lift it up, to strengthen that legacy and that history, while at the same time look forward look forward to what the next six, 60 years will be. And in order to do that, we've created this fall a strategic planning steering committee. This was the last component. I shouldn't say the last component of the restructure because the restructure really is a, a state of mind. It's a living, a living document, a, a philosophy of how we're going to work together. But the strategic planning steering committee is charged with developing the vision through the faculty, through all of our stakeholders, our alumni, uh, our board members, the wider community, into what the five years uh, ahead and beyond look like. You should have all received or will shortly an uh, invitation to participate in this conversation through a, a survey. Look for that. I thank you in advance for your voice in that conversation. What you tell us, what you share with us, not only will shape the 60th anniversary celebration in 21-22, but the years, the years that follow. Um, what I do know specifically, that the time we are in now is forcing a paradigm shift on all of us and specifically to artists that will create new pathways to reach larger audiences in new ways than we ever imagined. We already see it happening seven weeks into the semester with the ways that our product through our digital platforms are reaching larger numbers of people. This is going to have great implications not only for our impact here in Jacksonville and Northeast Florida and beyond, but also in recruitment and in many other ways to the college. So it's a very exciting time for, for our life together ahead. If, if no one else would like to add anything, um, I, we did receive a question in the chat about uh, Distinguished Alumni Award. So every year, for those of you who don't know, during homecoming and family week, the college traditionally celebrates um, some of their distinguished alums. I know that you'll be releasing those names to folks publicly next week, but can you talk a little bit about that recognition um, and maybe some of your past award recipients, their accomplishments as well? 
Absolutely, I'd be happy to. This is a, a new tradition of the college. We established the Honored Alumni Awards in 2017 in conjunction with Homecoming and Family Weekend, uh, a twofold purpose. Obviously to recognize the work of our distinguished graduates, but also as an opportunity to invite our alumni back to campus, to have a meal together, to enjoy fellowship, to reconnect, to spend time on campus. Uh, next week, I believe the press release is going out. I won't be a spoiler. Uh, you will, you'll read uh, the very exciting news of our two distinguished alums, uh, one in the performing arts and one in art and design. Uh, Jennifer Pasquale, uh, uh, distinguished graduate, uh, might be on this call here this afternoon. Jennifer is the director of music at St. Patrick's Cathedral, New York City. Class of 1992, Jacksonville University music grad, went on to pursue a doctor of musical arts at the Eastman School of Music in Oregon. She is one of the leading practitioners, artists of sacred liturgical music in the world today. The first female director and only female director of music at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, I would tell you about Michelle Grant Murray, class of 12, MFA, choreography. She went on to study at the Alvin Ailey Dance American Dance Theater. She went on from JU to study at the Dance Theater of Harlem. She is now artistic director of the Olujumi Dance Company of Miami. I tell you about Phil O'Reilly, class of 81 glass artist. Phil went on to an international career in glass. He's based in Seattle. Uh, he was an apprentice of Dale Chihuly. The, the awards are selected by the faculty. Colleagues, you can, I know I talk a lot, but you know, the three of you can interrupt any time. Don't let it, don't hold back. Um, I'd say that the, the unique thing about these awards is that the faculty select them. This is not a popularity contest. It's not based on uh, any kind of metric except what the faculty and their collective consultation of uh, uh, who they believe uh, we should recognize. So I, I think that's a really beautiful process. And then the other piece that makes it special is that we award the, um, the honorees with an artwork created by a member of this community. And in past years, that has been uh, Jim Benedict, sculpt, uh, sculptor, uh, Brian Fruess, glass piece. This year, Ryan Schultz, ceramics piece. Tiffany, I believe you did a piece the first year. Am I correct? I thought so. Yeah. I think what's beautiful about that uh, in-house art piece is that when we select a faculty member to, to produce the piece, we're asking them to think about their experience at JU, think about what it was like for that alum at JU, and what is the inner core of greatness about being affiliated at this institution, and then to take all of those concepts and wrap them together in original artwork the artwork is based in the media that, that the faculty members area of expertise. So every year the artwork changes, but the theme remains the same. And it's been really fun to see how those awards have changed over the years. Tiffany, you could speak to the thematic since you're here and made the award two years ago. Sure. Um, yeah, I enjoyed making this award and it was really fun to just think about my own experience as a faculty here and then also what the experience would have been like for students over the years and what my students are experiencing now. Um, when I did the award, I made it, um, they were shaped like boats and I was thinking about this idea of the journey that they've been on here near the river of our campus and the journey that they will continue on in their career beyond. Um, so that was the the theme that I chose to go with for the awards I made a few years ago. Wonderful, thank you all so much. Um, you touched on this a little bit, a few of you did, but um, the pandemic has really changed almost every aspect of life and that's no ex uh, exception for the arts. Broadway went dark, concerts and festivals were canceled. Um, and since the beginning of quarantine, I think we've all seen so many viral examples of how artists are really just spreading joy. Um, during this time with their craft um, in some new and creative ways. Can you talk a little bit about how our students adjusted last spring um, and just how things are changing for them? I'd love to jump in uh, because we were thrust right into the thick of it. Um, it. It was tough right off the bat, but we we're so fortunate in theater and that 
we're not necessarily, we're taught to learn how to learn. So uh, when things went down the way they went down, instead of performing entirely in a group, we would all record our parts separately on technology and then combine them later. And um, we're sort of going through some things like that this semester. And I think Tim touched on it earlier, things that we're going through now and exploring now at the university level, level that's going to change the industry forever. I can already tell you that the industry is, is prepped in some ways to handle the pandemic because of, um, you know, in Broadway theaters, in Vegas theaters where there's pyrotechnics or there's smoke, they have to have advanced filtration and air systems. So uh, there's a lot of research going into that right now. There's also a fogger that's used in theater and a solution that has been scientifically proven to kill flu viruses that are coronaviruses. So they're looking into that right now. Um, so I am, I am just impassioned every day by the amount of ingenuity um, and innovation that you see among theater artists. And I think our students are right in the thick of it, um, using the skills that they already have. Like our technical students, they would measure spaces between students that were being filmed for performances. They would calculate times in between performances um, and, and, you know, theater majors aren't known for math, but um, I, I, am, I am amazed every day at uh, how, how passionate these students are to keep the torch lit. And, and that passion is sometimes more than enough to keep my torch lit. So uh, I see all of this that happens at the university level, because remember, no one else can really practice theater right now the way that a lot of universities can because of the safety we have, because of the, the, the precautions that we're able to take. So um, we're innovating what's going to take off in the future, I believe. Oh, I'd like to dovetail off of that. I think the transition in the spring was more of a surprise and the students were reactionary to how the hell, heck is my professor going to be able to pull this off? And I think in working together, you know, the students really were triumphant and, and strong in the spring. So I think the chapter challenge became then in the transition to this fall section was, oh my gosh, as faculty, we have to ramp up our virtual essence because the students now have this expectation and a whole summer that we could prep for this animal that was to be the fall semester. And in reality, I think the biggest change on the industries for the visual or art and design side of campus would be the independent fabrication. Now, lots of art medias need to be done by teams. And with the social distancing and, you know, there's no touching, there's, try to blow glass by yourself. That is really difficult. Uh, try to make clay by yourself. Try to do an animation by yourself. So I think one of the things that has changed is the technology that's coming down the pipeline and that's being made available to us and to our students uh, facilitates that single production scenario. Maybe not ideal for everyone, but it is ideal for many that never knew because the tools weren't there to get it done. So I think that's really exciting about something that's going to stay and time to come. Tiffany? I would agree with that. And I was just thinking, you know, right now we have students who are working individually, but on teams from all across the world. So they're, they're at home where they have to be right now and international students, and yet they're part of a team that's here on campus. And especially within our media arts field and in visual arts, um, I think what we're really going to see this change that has occurred in our field where visual or virtual exhibitions become a new standard. I mean, it immediately, all of these new opportunities opened up to both students and practicing artists um, in our field of new gallery spaces that weren't available before that are reaching these broad audiences by becoming, by producing these virtual exhibitions. And it's really a top notch game. I mean, it's not, um, you know, just putting a few pictures together, they are doing this excellent job of creating virtual catalogs, creating spaces um, online that really look like you're in a gallery setting. And it's, it's really changed the landscape of what um, exhibitions will look like, I think, in the future. 
Wonderful. I know before this call we were talking about, I think it was Professor DeChico recently had a performance and Terry might hold 400, but now we're able to um, perform for audiences over a thousand. Um, so it's certainly, I suppose that's the silver lining perhaps in all of this. Um, this year we welcomed our largest class to date to JU. Um, can you talk a little bit about recruiting to the arts and what that looks like for the college, maybe what the freshman class looks like this year? Sure, Lauren, I'd be happy to kick that off and then I'm going to turn it over to the subject matter experts who are the faculty. Uh, because in the fine arts, it's an intensely personal uh, process, you know, in the, in the performing arts to recruit um, a class is, I liken it to athletics recruiting. You know, if, you, if you've got the orchestra, you've got a couple of key seats that need to be filled, uh, you, you actively recruit to those vacancies. Uh, that means uh, personal contact with prospective students. I see on the call right now, it's so good to see Ann McKinnon and Gia Cedra, two, two wonderful graduates of our music program. I um, know that they both had relationships with the faculty with whom they studied at Jacksonville University uh, semesters, if not years prior to coming. Uh, isn't that true, Ann? Yeah. It's... Um, it, that's, hi Angie, good to see you. So these are relationships that are built. The relationships that are built at a great distance for students uh, who come to study with us uh, from uh, reaches far and near. And it's a relationship that's built for many of our students who are in the Southeast uh, based on at least one or two uh, private lessons or individual coachings with our students. So it's very personalized. I'll follow up with that. You know, for recruiting for years, um, we've been attending these top, not top notch national conferences. Um, but one of the things that's really opened up in this last year about recruiting are these virtual information sessions where we get in front of the students really early and give them the opportunity to see our faces, talk to the faculty, get feedback, have conversation and really start to build that personal relationship like you were talking about Dean Snyder. Um, from the beginning of the recruiting cycle. Um, so I, I found that really these virtual, this virtual time has really broadened our audience of who you're reaching um, at these early stages of the recruiting game. It's a really great point, yeah. Uh, absolutely, multiple points of contact, like you say, Tiffany. Um, in, in theater, you're not just gonna have a couple classes with us every week, you're gonna have a couple classes and then you're gonna get to spend four hours with me every night. So we gotta really, really be able to work together. Um, and, and that's not just me, that goes for all our colleagues, but that's, that's four years of your life. So I think we do invest a great deal of time uh, through the entire admissions process. Um, we, uh, something I can speak to, we always say, where else are you looking? What else is going on? And we try to explain to our students what's different about JU and what is different about JU if you go to, any other school in the North Florida area for theater, you're gonna wait until your junior year to get on stage. We know at JU that by the time you get to your junior year, you might've lost interest in theater altogether. So we pride ourselves on putting our freshmen to work the moment they get here. And they are learning how to do theater and make theater so that when they leave Jacksonville University, they spread the good gospel. And I think too, our college, like I said, has gone through such great growth in the past couple years. Uh, for the, for, like Tiffany said, we're going to these national conferences and students are coming up to us and going, we hear you're from JU. And that's where I go, yeah, that's right. I like brownies, chocolate chip cookies, Diet Pepsi. <laughs> so no, not at all, not at all. Um, we pride ourselves on the special contact. We go to high schools. Um, Anytime we have a scholarship recipient and it's within reason, I travel to their senior award show and give them an award in person and let them know, hey, we're here for you. We want you at JU. And that's the reason I came to JU. I got into some really great schools as a young man. I got into Vanderbilt, but someone from JU showed up at my senior award ceremony, handed me a certificate, embarrassed me in front of my entire senior class. And I said, that's it. I'm going to JU. Yeah. They want me there. So I think that's the message we send our students is that we want them here. 
Yeah, I've got to jump in on that if I can, because I think, Eric, you raise a couple of really great points. You all do. But the, the idea, you know, there's, there's a distinct advantage uh, as, a, as a young artist to start your pre-professional training in a small, individualized program without an extended graduate program. I think that's true in many disciplines, but particularly in the arts, because like Eric says, you know, our first year students, they come here in dance or theater or in media arts or in glass, and they are in the studio immediately making craft, collaborating, making product, learning the skills of critique, improvement, self-assessment evaluation from real life faculty. And, you know, I mentioned uh, our esteemed institution, a state institution in Tallahassee, great respect for the school. It's one of the finest uh, performing arts, uh, fine arts schools in the country. Uh, extensive graduate program. We say to our prospective students, um, that's where you wanna go for your master's degree or for your MFA or for your terminal degree to afford yourself of that experience. It's not a matter of which is better. It's a matter of really recognizing the tremendous uh, opportunity at Jacksonville University in a small institution where the professors are with you, not teaching assistants in the studio and on the stage. Wonderful. There's a, uh, for those of you who haven't been to campus recently to see our new health sciences complex, there's a beautiful new art install in there from the college. Um, and, and really the whole campus of JU is home to so many beautiful pieces of public art. We heard that you're working on a way to highlight some of that. And I'm wondering if you might be able to give us a sneak peek about that project. I'm, I'd be happy to. Uh, I, am, I am thrilled that uh, we are close to unveiling what will be, uh, call it phase one of the uh, campus art um, improvement project. We are in the process, and we have been for about 18 months under the president's uh, request, thrilled when he uh, met with me uh, nearly two years ago and said, let's lean into this. We've got beautiful examples of artwork all around this campus, uh, but they're not identified in consistent ways. They're not cataloged. We're not lifting this up. Absolutely, President Cost, let's get on it. And we have collectively as the faculty and others so you will see here shortly, when you come to Campus Next, you will see a self-guided tour that's available to you uh, in a digital format through our website in our Welcome Center uh, that you'll be able to access biographical information about the artist. You'll be able to access information on the media, uh, the point of installation, the collaborative process, the donor involved, if that's the case. And then you will see signage uh, that is consistent and attractive and placed appropriately throughout campus to mark these works and their significance. You know, our campus art collection is a real asset to this institution. And uh, I look forward to working with my colleagues to lift that up in the years ahead. I think phase two, which we will start work on, I hope early next year, is enlisting the talents of our faculty and students in photography and capturing these works in very high quality images, not only for a print publication, a coffee table book, if you will, of the art collection, but also as a digital repository of the growing body of work. Wonderful. Well, we look forward to seeing that coffee table book. That sounds great. Uh, we had a question from a, a current parent about how we're preparing some of our student artists to really make a living uh, once they graduate. And I know that's something that the college prides itself on. Can you talk a little bit um, about that? You know, how we're teaching some of our visual artists to market themselves or, or things like that, how we're incorporating that into the curriculum? I would love to take that one. Um, and this is for every department in the college. Eric hit on it initially. We get those students in professional venues. Their resumes when they leave are experiential. They're not, I did this activity for a class. They're, I did this activity outside of my class and it was a real engagement. So number one, they're leaving with so much more experience than they can get at other institutions. They're leaving with a network of peers. Tiffany touched on this. We take them to conferences. We teach them how to network in their area of specialization. They're selling work. They're on stage in the community. 
maybe not so much this semester, but over the course of their four years, they leave with so much experience. We also have capstone courses that occur in each department. There's a lower level, freshman or sophomore, and then there's a senior level experience. So we're taking our students through something that's a little bit more like graduate school their senior year. That's how they learn to be professional. A lot of times they can't wait to get out in the field. They've already got contacts, they're already doing sales, they're already on the stage, they're already recording. Can I say more? I mean, they truly, truly know how to be who they are when they graduate. Eric, Tiffany, you wanna chime in on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we're always looking for ways to um, sort of curricularize those professional aspects. For instance, I'm teaching an auditioning course right now. And to successfully get out of that, that course, my students will have to have what well, all the necessary things they would need to get on a plane right now and go to New York City and go to some auditions. Um, uh, that's tough. That's a it's a hard course. It is. Um, and there, there's sometimes a lot of frustration. But um, uh, a way I think of it is coaching. And I always relate this back to a story of Michael Phelps coach um, who always taught Michael Phelps, do not leave your goggles lying around. You don't know what can happen to them. And Michael Phelps always left his goggles going around. So the coach one day saw this and he stepped on him and cracked him on purpose to see what would happen when Michael Phelps put them on and jumped in the water. Well, that happened. They went through this exercise together. Then at the Beijing Olympics, Michael Phelps had a crack in his goggles. He swam the whole race and won gold with waters filled up in his goggles. We step on the goggles at JU. We, we work in a training way to make it harder for them so that when they go to New York and they go to Atlanta, they're not caught up in the mire of just learning the basics of the industry. Like Dana said, they're soaring already. They're flying. Um, two years ago, we had a sophomore that was in a, uh, that was in a, professional production, a multi-million dollar professional production that was written by a Pulitzer Prize winner. That student has started his own theater company now. We can't ask, for, that's when we, when we go, oh, you're producing the work. We can't ask for much more. So um, I, think, I think Dana hit it right on the head. Yeah, that's, that's really great, Eric and Dana. You know, I, the economy, the artistic economy is quite different now than when it was when I graduated when many of us did. You know, I believe that at that time, uh, you graduated with a, a thorough training in the arts and you said, here, hello world, here I am, put me to work, okay? Uh, that's not enough now. So our young artists, they have to be able to be entrepreneurs. They have to be able to market themselves on social media and beyond. They have to be able to um, uh, track their expenses and income and revenue in their private practice, in their studios, whether they're giving voice lessons or acting lessons or working as a freelance choreographer or whatever, whatever they're doing, they need these hard skills so that they can be successful. Uh, a key tenet of the strategic planning process right now is to uh, curricularize, formalize this. Our students get this training now. They get it in the music professions course, which is part of our music curriculum. They get it in the uh, uh, critique and juried gate processes in the School of Art and Design from the faculty there who are intensely focused on pre-professional practice. They get it in the theater department and in the dance department through their uh, faculty mentorships. Um, speaking of the STEAM Institute, the implications of that crossover in the curriculum between uh, the Davis College of Business, Brooks Rehabilitation College of Healthcare Science, and the College of Arts and Sciences, of all of those disciplines, uh, we're going to be able very soon to offer uh, concise, core, intense, but compact, 30 credit hours, for instance, of design or theater or film specific curriculum that students can combine with uh, a career ready degree, if you will, marketing, uh, nursing, film and theater, communications and design, creating these, these possibilities. Thank you so much, Dr. Schneider. Um, we have a few more minutes, so, so feel free to drop in any last questions that you have for us in the chat. We got one more um, from an alum about uh, what our growing majors are in the college. Any, any emerging majors that seem to be, <laughs> Professor yeah. Chico might want to take that one. Sure. <laughs> 
Um, we're, we're, we're experiencing some wonderful growth in uh, theater arts. And I know there was a, a breath of um, this summer um, and, and we came back to a strong class. And I, and I can't help but relate that back to a, a very intense season of um, recruitment last year. We, we did a lot of recruitment work before the bottom really fell out in March. And um, this is one of the strongest classes we've ever seen. They are fierce. They are here to make art. And um, we're, we're, very, we're very glad to have them. We're very fortunate to have them. I think on the uh, art and design side, it's certainly graphic design. Film is at the top of the list. Illustration is doing very, very well these days. Photography is holding strong, but the interesting thing about photography is that the world, individuals, um, feel that their cell phones can take photographs great. And so the photography is a little, it's, it's holding strong, but students are looking for different avenues on top of that. And it's more of a commercial side of photography than it is the artful side of photography. I think ceramics and glass and sculpture, those are always going to be runners up in the game because it's intense. Um, it takes a lot of physicality, a, a lot of uh, non-air conditioned studio time. It's a rigorous degree. So those numbers we like to keep smaller so that the students have more studio time. But yes, absolutely in art and design, heavy hitters, film, graphic design, and illustration right up in there. Tiffany, did I, did I hit it close? You got it, Dana, that's exactly where we're at. We're at 300 majors right now, roughly 308 to be exact in the College of Fine Arts. Now that marks up a 23% growth uh, going back six years. Uh, majors are important. What's also important is servicing the students who come into our community who may not major in the arts. You know, we, we delivered thousands and thousands, roughly 5,000 credit hours last year in the College of Fine Arts to uh, individuals who are English majors, business majors, nursing majors, not necessarily minoring uh, in, in the arts, many are, but they want to take a glass course or they want to take a theater appreciation course or they want to take a music uh, history course uh, for their personal enrichment as part of what draws them to a liberal arts and sciences institution. It's tremendous value and our faculty thrive on that, that community. Thank you all so much for um, addressing all of those questions so well. Just such an exciting time for the college um, and so glad that we were able to show it off a little bit during this event. Uh, Dr. Steiner, before we close out, would you like to make any last um, remarks to the group? I just want to thank you, Lauren, and my colleagues for joining us today. Just so happy to see so many of our alums, parents, and friends on this call. Please continue to be in touch with us. Visit the college homepage. Check out our YouTube channels and our work. And please reach out to me anytime. I love to hear from our graduates. I love to hear from our parents. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all again for joining us, as Dr. Snyder said, and thank you, of course, for our, for our speakers for being so generous with their time and, and for doing such a great job of telling everyone what's going on in the college. Uh, I hope that you all are able to tune in later this week for some uh, additional homecoming and family week activities. As I mentioned earlier, this session will be recorded, so we'll be sharing this um, to our YouTube page. Of course, be sure to subscribe to the Linda Berry Stein College of Fine Arts YouTube uh, account for uh, the rest of the performing arts series content. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thanks again for joining us and stay safe and healthy.